Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. We are interviewing Bethany Klabanov today, who knows all about Power BI. She has a PhD in what, what is it specifically? Mathematical Behavioral Science. Okay, so she is super smart, way smarter than me, at least on the technical side. So what we're going to be uncovering is what is the value of a Power BI certification? What are the trends that she's seeing in the data visualization space? And also what are hiring managers looking for in candidates? So Bethany, how are you doing today? I am doing fine, thanks. So I guess let's just jump into that first question. Um, what do you see as the value of uh, Power BI certification? Well, I think for any kind of certification, regardless of Power BI or other, it it's only like a foot in the door, right? So you're basically saying and proving to somebody that you have some base level of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only thing I would say any certification really tells you. I've seen lots of over the years um, kind of come and go. And they generally do not replace real world experience. Um, mm -hmm. Because knowing that this is a function and how that function works and knowing when should you actually apply that or how to take something messy and turn it into something that appears clean on the other side, um, which is a lot of what's happening in a lot of the visualization tools, uh, is not well defined and uh, just takes a lot of experience. So we have actually covered this on the podcast and we have an antidote for that <laughs> specific problem, which is um, we tell people to couple a certification with a portfolio. So what you can do is go out and find some really dirty data, clean it up, analyze it, visualize it, and then tell a story. So that way, you know, you have that proof of I can do it. I have the certification. And then also it's kind of, um, a little bit of a guarantee that someone else didn't create that profile for you or that portfolio for you. Yes. I mean, and, and I think the dirty data is key because that's the other thing is you see people come out of classes and things like that. And generally speaking, um, there you're focused on the techniques or, you know, like here's the specific thing you're trying to learn. And so you get clean data that's going to mm -hmm. work the way that you want it to. Um, you know, even the sample data set that comes with, you know, a tool or something like that is pretty nice and clean and has like is well organized and um, has clear hierarchies where there are supposed to be hierarchies and they all align nicely and you can you can practice the basics, but that is not where most of the time is spent on anything data related. Um, and I think that's kind of a generally I think it's well established that still ha still somehow un underappreciated that regardless of what you're doing with data, that the cleanup and understanding and realignment and rejiggering of, of it is going to be the vast majority of your time. Mm. So I've had a completely different experience, but I do work like in my consulting practice, I work with companies that are 150 million or less. And like if they're using the square card reader to collect, you know, mm -hmm. their sales information, that's pretty much like out of the box clean unless there's like some issue. Um, so I've seen companies that are younger companies that are still kind of a mess. Um, really? Yeah. I've seen companies that are even very technologically advanced in what they sell. Um, I worked with a company that does uh, data center security and um, they have in their lobby a, uh, depiction of like real-time threats like they're detecting from you know Russia or China or wherever they may be coming from um, and it, so it's a b2b company but their data they didn't necessarily know because it's more complicated in a b2b um, environment your sales mm -hmm. data because oftentimes you're selling things directly that are maybe bigger deals as well as you're selling things through distributors and resellers so you get it and how they collect it out um, or collect that data is not always consistent. So trying to pull that all back together again um, is not that easy. It's something I've done a lot for, for a lot of different B2B companies. So I have some tricks up my sleeve of how to do that. Yeah. But um, it's, it's not a ready, it's not just like, oh, hey, let me put it all in one place and 
here it yeah. all goes together and I know what's happening. So, so like they did not really know uh, who exactly they were selling to or how much, even though what they sold is more complicated than that. Oh, that's <laughs> it's, interesting. You know, al- algorithmically more complicated, but um, in some ways more straightforward, I guess, you know, I mean, that, that's the thing is like a lot of, of the, those kinds of problems when you're talking, like all of the data problems are not big data problems. Sometimes they're small data problems. B2B has a lot of small data problems. Um, it's not that they have such large volumes of sales to deal with, but because they're so distributed, pulling them all back together again in a coherent way where you're not duplicating what I sold to a distributor, distributor, I now have to strip out of my ERP data and pull in and understand from them and the timing of, of those transactions with when they sell it are off. Like, so there get to be a lot of business problems that are into the data mm-hmm. when you're dealing with that kind of situation. So That's interesting. It, it really depends on what kind of company it is and the kind of data that you're trying to look at, what kinds of problems there are. Yeah, I will say this. Um, I mean, data governance is like one of the three steps that I walk through <laughs> for my clients. Um, it's not sexy though. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of after we've gone through and developed like, all right, here's your initial sales dashboard. This is what we can visualize. And then they start to like use it and, and, and figure out the mm-hmm. interactivity. And they're like, oh, we want to look at this. It's like, well, if you want to look at this, then we're going to have to clean up your Salesforce data. Yes. And that's the other, the, I mean, and that's one of the big problems is Salesforce, not to be hating on Salesforce, but it's more the implementation of Salesforce. I've never seen a clean implementation of Salesforce in my life. Um, so I've, I think I've had three or four clients where I've worked with their Salesforce data at this point. Um, I've had yeah. more than that. And I've seen some <laughs> real bastardizations of Salesforce. I actually saw one company where they had a hub and spoke of different Salesforce instances where they were trying to use Salesforce as like a marketing automation tool on some of those spokes. It was not good. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, this is part of the reason why I wanted to interview you because you've gotten quite a bit more experience than I do. I mean, like the, the typical thing that I see is that um, they'll have it as you can type in a specific value, which like you want to remove that manual pro- like input oh, as much as no, possible. Oh, yeah. Because what happens is, well, there's two things that happen that I see a lot in Salesforce. One, um, they get Salesforce and have been usually the higher ups believe that's going to somehow magically solve all their problems. Hmm. they then take all the stuff from the old system and just shove it into the new box. So it's all the old problems. They're just in a new shinier package. Uh. Um, So that's one thing that happens. Um, The other thing that can happen is even if they make a clean break, maybe they just say, okay, this is the legacy system and we're just going to start fresh. Or they do some cleanup of the stuff before they bring it in is they don't put in the right process. Um, so that it limits like who can create a new record. So if I'm going to create, uh, again, in B2B, it gets very complicated about who's a customer, right? It sounds super simple, but is it a global entity? Is it like, is Berkshire Hathaway your customer or is it every subsidiary of them that's your customer if you work with companies that size? Is it each region of, you know, if you're Dairy Queen, is it Dairy Queen, which is part of Berkshire Hathaway? Is it Dairy Queen US? Is it Dairy Queen on that corner over there? Like who's your, who who counts as a customer? But if you don't have controls over who can put stuff in there, it becomes a big hodgepodge and you end up with uh, duplicates of customers, you know, here's part of a hierarchy, here's another part that should really be together, but they don't link together. Um, but that's not about Salesforce even. That's again, that's how you've set it up. That's about who you've given credentials to, to create new data. Um, and, and your process that you create around data creation that most companies don't think about. Right. And this is, this is the thing I like to say is the, most companies data has happened to them. <laughs> right. It's yeah. just kind of happened to them. They, they, don't, they haven't necessarily thoughtfully thought about it. Um, you know, 
it's, it's what's come out of like, this is what we need to do for the fundamental functioning of our business. Like I have a good and I'm trying to get it to a person. Um, and there's certain things that have to happen along the way for me to get the goods, turn it around and get it back out again. Generally speaking, all of the analysis that you might like to do has not necessarily been part of the plan of that. Okay. So to sum this up, <laughs> learn, well, I think to sum this up, you should understand like the core tenants or the basic foundation of data governance. Yes. And I, I would say also for anything, this is, this is like any kind of thing you're doing with data. The visualization is great. And it's, it's what people see. Um, and that's what they're going to cling on, you know, cling to and how you can actually get some momentum for fixing up some of these other things. Cause now it's in their face, right? Like I can only tell you what's in the data. So if it's super messy, that's what I can tell you. So now you're going to have to put some effort into cleaning it up. If you want to see it the right way and put into place, you know, what are our common language uh, definitions so that we're defining a gross margin the same way across the company so that when you see this category that it's broken down into the same component parts in the same way. Um, but, um, but the thing that getting to that point even is I think anybody who works with data needs to think of themselves a little bit as a detective, like the lineage or provenance, you know, whatever you want to call it of that data, how it came to be is equally as important as what you see in that field. I mean, I've seen things happen like from back when it was really hard to put a new field in a database, people taking a field that existed, it had some name on it and just changing what it was for. Like whatever it was for before is an important, <laughs> we're just going to put a completely new thing in there. So like up to some date, it was one thing. And then afterwards is something completely different that has nothing to do with what it's called. Wow. Because that was what was expedient. At the bit they were trying to accomplish in the operations of the business. Interesting. Wow. So, so you can't ever just take what it says or what it's supposed to be at face value like understanding how that data came to be is often very uh, important in understanding what can you actually do with it or how can I get it to be, to, how can I solve the problem of X with, you know, it's not coming through the way I expect it to. A lot of time that's a people problem. Yeah. And it kind of gets back to the thing we were talking about before we um, hit record today of, are you an order taker or are you an advisor? Because if you can start mm -hmm. doing that detective work and figuring out what exactly is going on with the data, then all of a sudden you become way more effective as an analyst. You can ask for more money. You can have, you know, stronger, <laughs> stronger um, job security there because you become it, so much more valuable. You kind of own the data in a way. You do. And you also, you get to learn and understand what are doing. And I have found you can really leverage being the owner of the data to, to being connective tissue between different parts of the business. So I've oftentimes owning like, okay, I own the customer database. We take all these different things. We clean it up. We put it all together. Um, different people would come to us for data. If you just say, if they just come and ask you for the data and you say, okay, here, here's what you asked me, asked for me. Um, that's all you're ever going to be, right? People mm -hmm. will ask you for queries and you'll give them back the specifics of whatever their query is. Um, it can figure out from them, well, what is it you're trying to understand? And this is true even like with Power BI. If somebody says, give me a graph of this. Well, why do you want that graph? Like, what is it that you're trying to get out of that graph? Like, what is the actual, like data is an information, right? You've got to do something to it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. to create information. So like, what's the information that you're looking for from this data? Because I might be able to take it to another level of what they're expecting because I understand what's there. Right. Or I understand like, you know, you're trying to accomplish this, this. Well, guess what? There's another group over here that already came to me about the same thing and you guys should probably work together or they're mm -hmm. halfway down that Or maybe road. you're asking the wrong question. 
or you're asking yeah. the wrong question. There's lots of different ways that can go. Um, I've seen all of those things happen, you mm -hmm. know? So I've put different people together who should be working on something more broadly together because they're doing, they're just duplicating efforts, <laughs> um, you know, because they're yeah. in different, maybe mm -hmm. one's in product marketing and the other person's in, you know, uh, some specific customer mark, you know, group, you know, for some specific customer kind of marketing and, but they, they, what they're trying to do really is coming together and they should leverage that more or, um, you know, to your point that they're asking the wrong question or, or there's a better way, you know, well, you wanted a bar graph, but really if you looked at it in this tree map with an added in a couple of other dimensions, you'll actually get at what you're trying to answer a lot faster than 50 bar graphs. Right. So yeah, yeah, I think that is a huge thing of kind of taking ownership. It's almost like you have that founder mentality of I own this process. This is mine and I'm going to be making sure that you get the most out of it. Let's jump into what do you see are the emerging trends in the data visualization space? Definitely, I see a lot, a big increase in Power BI over some of the other ones. Uh, a lot of the large companies um, have been getting very good deals on that from Microsoft. Uh, yeah, let's dig down into that. Which pushes that. that. <laughs> yeah, because we, we talked about this before we went on air about, um, so we both come from the Tableau world, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, or I guess I'm kind of in, impartial, it doesn't matter to me. I think Power BI is going to be the market player like mm -hmm. the biggest player in this space long term because I think so because I mean everyone had they already uh, so many companies already have that Microsoft 365 suite it's ten dollars more to get Power BI yeah and so when you're looking at at reporting um being able to push that out to as many people as possible in a cost-effective way that's what's that's where Power BI shines, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's where it's super low cost because that's, that's the biggest factor in reporting. So the visualization is good enough for right. most reporting and better than what you've had in a lot of the, um, the more legacy kind of BI systems, right? So it's more adaptive, it's more you know, quicker to develop, et cetera, than uh, like the Cognoses and things that, that were very prevalent in the past that it's, yeah. it's all replacing. Um, I st but even for those companies that are very invested in Power BI for a lot of that reporting, I don't see Tableau not existing. I, a lot of them have both, but Tableau is fewer people and more around analysts, right? So if okay. I'm trying to do more of an analysis, not reporting, right? Because reporting is really about the breadth of who you can get it to okay. in a timely manner, yeah, yeah. right? If I'm doing analysis, the speed at which I can do that analysis is then what's important. And I think that's where Tableau really shines. And, and I think um, people who are analysts tend to at least in my circles that I talk to, tend to like Tableau better. So getting a few licenses is generally less of a hurdle than the, you know, getting approval for right. licenses across. Because Tableau the whole is significantly it, more um, it, pricey than Power Exactly. BI. Yeah, but, I, I think that we should talk about that, about um, the value of being tool agnostic. Like we talked yes. about this um, before about, so I came, up the, I, I'm, we're in the middle of pushing out a um, new Power BI certification course, but I learned Power, uh, Tableau first, but learning Power BI from the lens of first having the Tableau experience has been really interesting because it's breaking down some of my biases and challenging kind of the way that I attack problems. I, mm -hmm. I'm actually pretty weak at data modeling, which is like the core, <laughs> if you look at the um, exam DA 100 study guide, up to 30%. So one in three questions are related to data modeling. So I've yeah. probably spent 200 hours since this lockdown started, just like diving deep <laughs> into Power BI. Well, I think data modeling is certainly, it's, and it's, it's not that it doesn't matter for Tableau either. Um, how you model the data is going to determine how easy or hard something is to do, right? And so mm -hmm. sometimes you need to create a different structure 
to enable you to have the functionality that you want, right? And, and sometimes it's not even a matter of, could you do it with the, the data structured this other way? But how many calculations do I need to do? How complicated are those calculations? How much is that gonna slow down the user experience? Because every time I change any little thing, it's like doing five bazillion you know, calculations in the background to render it the right way. Yeah, optimize um, the model for performance is a specific so, <laughs> topic on the exam guide. You know, and so sometimes, um, you know, you actually have to create more than one, right? So I've had things where it's like, I've got one data structure for 90% and then there's one other kind of visualization or something that you want to know where all the data, all the information is still in that other structure, but to get to it is so much more complicated. It doesn't make any sense. It's better to just structure the data completely separately for that other 10%. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, I said, I'll, I'll take your word for it. I haven't <laughs> run into those. So, I mean, most of the companies I'm working with don't have really complex, um, like data structures. So it's, it's pretty simple for me, but, um, you know, if, if I'm going well, to continue teaching, I need to like, what understand. You want to yeah. So sometimes it's what you want to show. So for instance, I've seen things where the, you had your basic like reporting for, you know, here's what happened in what month and what, what portion of these kinds of customers were purchasing and all of that. So you've got your like very mm -hmm. basic structure. Um, if you want to start looking at other things, like one of the ones I'm thinking about is looking at longevity of customers. Like we had a definition of what made a customer new, how long they were new for, when they cycled out of that, um, if they, how long it took them till they were dormant, if they came back from being dormant and, and tracking that through. All of that is in that other data. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But it's not easy to create any kind of visualization of your basic uh, like sales reporting data to show how how those customer status are changing over time like that. So creating a different structure of data by the where the it's the customer is kind of like that core. Um, it makes it a lot easier to create something to visualize. Yeah. All right, so we've touched on yeah. what's the value of a certification, emerging trends, Power BI and Tableau difference. Let's close on what are you seeing in terms of people getting their analytics jobs, so the hiring process? Like what, what are the trends that are emerging or is there a, kind of a structure there? Yeah, I think that a lot of it depends upon what part of your career you're in um, mm -hmm. as far as what's asked of you. Um, I think particularly for jobs that are very hands-on, um, I think there's a lot of people who are going to some kind of test of some sort, you know, whether that be, um, you know, something that they purchased, which there are things out there. That I literally saw one of those on the Power BI subreddit yesterday, uh, this company. Uh, that yeah, does, they, they use chatbots apparently to like run you through these series of questions. I don't know. There's some company on a scene, I've, before, but I've not done those. I've not done those myself. Um, I know they exist and mm -hmm. I know that there's companies um, and I've talked to people who have looked into them. Um, a lot of times I find that People who are more interested in those, I think, are people who are trying to hire people with data skills when they do not have them. Oh, that is an interesting point. I have not thought about that before. And I have seen yeah. that be a huge debacle when you have people who are trying to, and this is where I've seen some people who are data science people or analytics people who are not, in my estimate, really that. Um, they're fundamentally lacking certain skills, but they knew more than who hired them, or they knew more jargon, or could were confident in their jargon. I'm not really sure, but who, who like I figured out pretty quickly in working with them that they did not know. <laughs> <laughs> one person, you know, one person who was supposed to be a, a, a statistician, um, 
like did not understand how the software worked. Wow. So what you're saying is um, learn all the jargon and you can, you know, kind of fool everyone to get your first job. <laughs> well, to a certain extent, I mean, I think that's happened. And I think that some of these, these tests that are coming around are because people have gotten a little bit burned by some of those things that have happened. Yeah. On a more yeah. serious note, I think that it, the way you communicate and knowing the keywords and it's almost like you have a specific vernacular that you speak. There is, I would say from the flip side of that, <laughs> I mean, I have mixed feelings about those things, right? Because okay. I, in my mind, like if it's very hard and this is even now for like with all of the kind of bot type, you know, like algorithms that are picking if you, somebody even ever talks to you when you submit your resume, right? The way that the terms that I use, if I don't use the exact same term that some HR person who has no idea what I do typed into some system that they really are the same thing, right? Hmm. Uh, then they, I don't get pulled out of the list or, you know, it's like you're, you're counting on somebody understanding synonyms in your space that they don't always do. I've had people in HR talking to interviewing me, um, you know, and I might've just been talking to them about, um, you know, a regression model I ran or some clustering that I've done. Um, different kinds of algorithms, maybe even that I've used for clustering. And they'll be like, do you, so do you do machine learning or AI? And I'm like, okay, all the things that I just talked to you about are, are, very, are specific examples of those things. So you don't know what you're asking, right? And they're just looking to check off sometimes boxes. So in my mind, sometimes for me, it's a red flag if they're asking me to do some of those kinds of things. Cause I'm like, well, why are you asking me do this rather than have me talk to somebody because mm. I'm confident that I can talk to people and understand like, do they know what they're doing or not by asking them to tell me about problems and how did they approach it? And what were the things that came up along the way? I, I'm less concerned if, if, if I can, if I can get at people's logic skills, I'm less concerned about their specific programming because the lot that changes the programs change, but logic doesn't. Right? Yeah, but but that presupposes <laughs> that that you actually got through the screening process. So we it actually, does. yeah, we interviewed someone who is, um, I think they're the head of enterprise analytics for like one of the major banks, and he does the hiring process. He says step one of his process is that they have automation that weed through resumes. So yes. it's almost and that's the frame of the mind is almost like how I do keyword research for my YouTube yes. videos. So like you need to yes. basically research the job you want, copy all of the key terms and make sure that it's in your resume because you're not even going you to get put do. in the door. Yeah. Which is, no, it's, which is weird, so, but it's like the state of how things are right now. That's uh, well, but I would say a lot of that, it's not that it doesn't exist for smaller companies because they're then using like indeed and you mm -hmm. know, LinkedIn and wherever that's that's doing that. So you do definitely need to see like, do they spell out specific things or do they use a more catch all, right? Because if I list out 50 different machine learning techniques and I don't say machine learning and they're looking for machine learning, then they're not going to catch my thing, right? Even though I'm putting all the things that have to do with it, mm. if I don't use that actual term, then they're not going to pick me. Right. So, so you do need to look at the job that you want and look at what they're specifically so that you can be a good enough match that you can try to get to the next spot. The other thing is if you are a little far, it's a little, it's definitely harder when you're first starting out, but the farther along you are is you still need to do that probably, if, especially if it's a company, you're just kind of throwing it out there <laughs> into the ether as it were. Right. Um, but trying to go and see, do I know anybody even peripherally who works at right. that company who I can try to connect with and get them to put my resume forward so that I can get around some of those bots. Yeah. Um, that's going to help you a lot. Um, and the other thing is, you know, you can try, if you're having a lot of trouble getting by those steps, try looking at smaller companies because smaller companies are going to have less of it. 
That's interesting. Yeah, you're right. I, I think that the size of the organization does depend on how you need to approach because yeah, if it's a billion dollar organization, they have the budget to create some automation in how they source candidates to actually interview. But yeah, if it's a yeah, and they're going through such volumes, it makes not. sense. Right. Yeah. Right. It doesn't make any sense for them to do it. The only way that it would be, um, it would be happening is because they use like a third party system that has some of that inherent in it. But again, you know, if if you, there's a company that you're really interested in, you don't have to just you know, oh, I'm going to put apply through LinkedIn and now, oh, well, I get, they talk to me or they don't talk to me. If you're really interested in that job, um, look and see who is in that company that you might either are connected with or can get connected to, mm -hmm. or just Google them. You might be able to just, they might be on the company, their email might be on the company website or, you know, mm. do something. You but know, do something to try to go around it and get more direct contact with the person. Well, I mean, think about how, how you and I met. We, we were on a webinar, what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to meet these people in person. And, and I can kind of share with you guys how I approach finding podcast guests is that I just get out there on LinkedIn and I start commenting on posts that are relevant to me. Because if someone is posting, they want that interaction. So you can start to... I don't know if I should use the word organically because it social media feels the opposite of organic to me, but you can it's actually not, start. So it's not really organic. <laughs> yeah. You can, for lack of a better word, organically build a relationship by just interacting with what those people are putting out. And because most people will accept friend requests or connection requests on LinkedIn, especially if you're in the same space. So, you know, kind of to piggyback off what you said about find if you know anyone well, if you don't know anyone at that company, that doesn't mean you can't meet them and actually make a connection. Yeah, and the other thing is to make it, I, I think you definitely want to try to not make it super just transactional, not like you've got, you've got a job and I want, I want this job, you know, <laughs> like, you yeah. know, if, if it's the first time you're approaching the person, um, you know, maybe you, you, are a little softer in your approach, you know, if it's just like, Hey, this is what you can do for me. Um, that might not go over so well, but if you're more like, Hey, you know, I saw your hiring in this, this is an area I'm interested in. I'm really interested in your company because blah, 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 blah. You've done a little research on their company. Um, I'd really learn to love to learn more about it and you and why you like working there. And, you know, how, how you, I, th I think this is where the softer side of things does matter, right? You know, it's, you can't just come and say, hey, I'm a great programmer and I'm, I'm great at building BI, you know, Power yeah. BI dashboards, hire, you should hire me. Like, it needs to be a little bit more of a social kind of engagement to try to get them to actually engage with you rather than just, I'm looking right. for something from you. you don't want to come you. off and say, hey, look, get me a job here. Buddy. Right. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it's like um, you got to be a little bit more finesse. Well, Bethany, yeah. I really appreciate you coming on. I feel like we covered so much ground here. Um, I will um, look forward to like actually posting this. I think we're going to pull some podcast highlights out of this, but thanks oh. again. I appreciate yeah, it. No problem. Have a great rest of your day. Uh, you too.